you're live. Hello, and welcome to our Facebook Live series, Ask the Vision Loss Experts, Coping with COVID-19. My name is Dr. Trisha Grant, and I'm the Senior Director of Low Vision Research at the Chicago Lighthouse. And I'm Dr. Brian Walensky. I'm a low vision optometrist in New York City, and I work with WorkCam Technologies. So our intent is to bring you this series to discuss topics, engage people, and share information as pertains to vision loss uh, during this time of social isolation and this pandemic. Uh, and in these episodes, we want to bring guests, topics, and concerns of the community during this time. And we welcome everyone to join, whether you or a loved one are visually impaired or blind, or you just want to learn more about the experiences of people who have vision loss, especially during this time of social distancing. Thank you so much to everyone who joined us last week. We appreciate all the great feedback that we received. We even received a few more questions over the weekend. But before we get to those, we wanted to let everyone know that today is World Book Day. Yeah, today is World Book Day. It celebrates authors, illustrators, books, and reading. However, for some reason, when I looked up World Book Day, it's a different day in the UK, Ireland, and one town in Delaware. I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> they just do a different day. But uh, what book are you reading, Dr. Grant? So I am reading a couple of things. I always have about 10 reads going on at once, but the thing I'm focusing on this week is the American Journal of Public Health was so gracious, they sent out a free copy of their April issue. So there's a lot of great stuff in here to read. And then I've also been trying to read one fiction book a month just to kind of take my mind off of things. And what I'm reading this month, and I'm reading it on my iPad, is uh, James Baldwin, Go Tell It on the Mountain. How about you, Dr. Walensky? What are you reading? So I'm kind of boring. I'm reading textbooks. I'm uh, brushing up on some of my knowledge. I'm reading my retina book. Uh, I've been seeing a lot of uh, emergencies uh, two days a week at the university. Uh, so brushing up on some of the basics, which is always a good idea. Absolutely. Um, definitely. And, uh, you know, I hope everybody else is getting their reading in too, when we can. Um, I know uh, we had some unanswered questions last time uh, that we didn't really get to. And just so everyone knows, when they list their questions, they're a little bit delayed for us to see. So we're getting them texted into us. So uh, just be aware of that, but we do want to get to them. Uh, so Dr. Grant, I know you had uh, one question there that uh, we had from last time. Yeah, so the first question that we have today comes from Robin Bradley Whalen, and we're going to hear more about her later today. But she says, masks are a problem for me and a lot of people who have vision loss. Even if just a speck of my vision is blocked, I freak out. My mask fogs up my glasses. Do you have any suggestions? And Dr. Linsky, you did a lot of great work over the weekend to tackle this problem. Can you tell us what you learned? Sure, thanks a lot. No, it's a big problem for a lot of people. And especially if you you know, have a visual impairment and then your glasses fog up while wearing a mask, I mean, it gets in the way of your vision as it is. So uh, myself included, I was wearing my sunglasses outside and then I just stopped wearing them because it was fogging up. So I looked up a bunch of different solutions that were out there and I actually went and tested them out and tried it out. Uh, I know some of the web, some websites talk about uh, using toothpaste or shaving cream on your lenses. Another one talks about uh, using uh, soap, uh, soapy water and letting it dry. Um, really, I don't find it a great idea to use any chemicals or something on your lenses because it could run, ruin the lens and also there's different coatings on there. So it's not the greatest idea, or at least I didn't think so, that the way your lenses are expensive and you don't want to ruin them. Um, so really what I found after testing out a bunch of other techniques is the tissue paper method. And how that works is you just take a basically a Kleenex tissue paper or regular tissue paper and you fold it over end over end and you leave a full length of the tissue paper with about a, uh, an inch in thickness and you tape that to the inside of the mask and you leave about a quarter inch above the nose. So you're taping it right where it goes over the bridge of your nose. Leave a quarter inch that's sticking on the outside. And when you place it on, it makes a really nice barrier. So none of the moisture from your breath gets up into the lenses and it really, really works well. Oh, that's great. And I know you made a video that uh, explains this in more detail. So um, where can we find the video? Yeah, you can find the video on Facebook, on OrCam. I don't know, did Chicago Lighthouse probably shared it? We will ask them if they have not. Uh, um, okay, but we, we, you can find it on fa Facebook and LinkedIn, I believe it's, it's on as well. And um, a question, if you are wearing a mask that has, some of the masks have metal over the bridge to kind of form them to your nose. Do you still use this method or does that work as well with those types of masks? 
so yeah, well, I find that this tissue paper method, you need to use it with any mask, whether there's a wire in there, you really need to have that seal. The, the wire doesn't catch all the moisture and it's really, that's what, that's what the tissue paper is doing and not allowing anything to come up into, into, into the glasses area uh, to keep it from fogging up. So whether you're using one with a metal piece that goes over your nose or you're using a homemade mask, or even a surgical mask, whatever mask it is, really, it, it, it works. You just need that seal. That is great advice. Thank you. So I know we had some more questions, and I know we had one from Ellsworth Grant from Buffalo Grove, Illinois. And uh, this is a great question because, um, you know, it's something we want to know about our family members. You know, if we have an older, visually impaired family member uh, who's sheltering in place, you know, what should we bear in mind uh, when deciding whether or not to visit someone? Yeah, and this is a really great question and it relates to the main issue with this pandemic and that's being separated from our loved ones. The shelter in place order is still active for many of us in most states and it does recommend that you avoid visiting anyone's home who does not, you know, anyone outside your home. So anyone who doesn't live with you. And this is because of the asymptomatic nature of COVID-19. You may have the, um, the infection without showing any symptoms. So the best thing to do is keep your distance for now. That being said, if you are particularly concerned about a family member, um, either about their physical or their mental well-being, you, you should by all means pay a visit. And what you want to do when you do that is make sure that you are wearing a mask and um, make sure they're wearing a mask as well or just covering their face in some way. Um, you want to make sure that you are leaving all of your outside clothing and uh, shoes at the door. So don't bring your coat and shoes and trek through the house and that. Um, wash your hands immediately when you come into the house. And then you wanna be very mindful of surfaces because people who have visual impairments, they are very tactile and they use their surfaces to navigate around their house. So if you're coming in and possibly been exposed, you wanna make sure that you're not leaving any of that. So disinfect all of your areas. So it's a good idea if you have disinfectant wipes or your own spray and cloth to bring it with you so that you can do that. Um, you also want to keep six feet of distance from your family member, which is very hard. I just saw my mom for the first time over uh, in over a month and I did want to just hug her, but we had to keep our distance. So it's for our, um, their safety and yours. And um, then you also, it's a really good idea to keep the uh, windows open. So let the air circulate around into the house. And that's just so if there is a virus in the house, it's just not sitting still in the air. Um, and then another hard thing is to keep these visits short. If you're really coming in just to check on someone for their well-being, you just want to come in, check, and then um, and then leave quickly. So don't don't hang around too long. Now, one question I have is like, should people like you know wear gloves upon entering? Should they put on if they're wearing gloves? Should they put on a new pair when they come in if they had to go? Yeah. Yeah, that's a really great question. A lot of people are leaving the house with both mask and gloves, but you don't want to use your gloves and to you know get to the house and you're touching all types of surfaces and bring them into the house. So if you are coming into the house, take off the gloves, go wash your hands. If you have a fresh pair of gloves, even better put those on. Um, but that's a really good point. Just be really mindful of, of what you could be possibly bringing into the house. Um, so this next question, it comes from Nathan Carr from Buffalo Grove, Illinois. And this is something that I can very much relate to. Ever since the shelter in place started, all of my classes have gone online. I'm on the computer and the phone all day long. Halfway through the day, my eyes hurt and sometimes I even have a headache. Should I be concerned? What do you think, Dr. Wimpy? Should, should we be concerned about this? Well, yeah, it's definitely concerning. I mean, all of us are on our computers all day. Uh, a lot of us, I mean, uh, it, not only for work, but for entertainment, for watching movies or doing whatever. Uh, you know, we actually, in the optometry world, we call this digital eye strain. Now, of course, there's a lot of symptoms from, from digital eye strain and computer eye strain. You know, the thing is, is that if, the, if these symptoms that I'm gonna go over in a moment are something that persists after using a computer, definitely call your eye doctor. But if it's something just transient while you're using a computer, you know, there are some tips and things that we can do. So if you're having like eye fatigue, eye strain, possibly even blur after using the computer for a while, or possibly even like a doubling of vision, it's because we're so close to the screen. Our eyes actually converge when we're close to things. So our eyes want to like actually look out in the distance and be at more of a relaxed mode. So we call it, you know, the optometry world is tw the 2020 rule. So for every 20 minutes that you're on the computer, you, you look for 20 seconds away at 20 feet. So for every 20 minutes, 
look 20 feet away for 20 seconds and then you come back to the back to the computer there are actually some apps out there that actually remind you to do this i had it on my computer it got annoying after a while it's just good to remember to you know take that take that break for a little while give your eyes a kind of a break to look far away at something now some people experience even dry eyes red eyes in front of the computer um, and it can even from dry eyes uh, it can actually blur up your vision as well and one of the reasons is we actually blink less when we're in front of a computer screen. So our eyes dry out. So you can hydrate your eyes with some artificial tears. Uh, some people even find that wearing a shield or sort of like a uh, filter uh, can actually help uh, with it not drying out the eyes. Um, some people uh, will have glare off their screen. Uh, so you wanna make sure that there's no light coming from behind you onto the screen bouncing off, or even if you're in front of a window. Now, while natural light is great coming back from behind you on a, on a piece of paper, it might not be great for a computer screen. So you wanna make sure the window is to the side of you and not behind you. You can also turn down the brightness of your screen, but if you're sensitive to contrast, you might not wanna do that. And then you can use also negative contrast, which would be helpful. Um, like I said, you want to make sure that if these symptoms persist, then it could be something to worry about and you want to contact and call your eye doctor. That's really great advice. And for, for those of us who are not familiar with the term negative contrast, can you tell us what that is and how to do it? Sure. It's basically just changing your screen over and it's in, it should be in your options in your computer and cell phones uh, to uh, just change the, uh, the screen basically from a, to, from a white background with black letters to a black background with white letters. And actually I find a lot of my glaucoma patients like this because a lot of my glaucoma patients will um, complain of glare. And actually this helps, helps tremendously with glare. Um, also another thing to mention um, is you also before bedtime, you might wanna consider not using any of your devices or, or uh, apps or your computer or your tablet um, because there's blue short wavelength light that is emanated from the screens that we all use. And this can actually interrupt our melatonin levels and interrupt our sleep. So it's recommended that don't use your screens about two to three hours before bedtime. Uh, cause some people might mix that up. Oh, I'm not sleeping. It's from the computer use. Well, yeah, it is from the computer use, but it's not dangerous. It's just messing with those levels. So, you know, if you want to, instead of using your computers, uh, read a book, read a paper book, not that, do audible books, say it's book day, you know, let's all yeah. read something. That is really great advice. Um, so for those who are just joining us, my name is Dr. Trisha Grant and I am the Senior Director of Research at the Chicago Lighthouse. And this and is I'm Dr. Dr. Brian Walensky and I'm a low vision optometrist in New York City and work with OrCam Technologies. Welcome today, we're discussing topics uh, that pertains to vision loss in this time of uh, this pandemic and social isolation. So since we started social distancing, you and I have both been in constant communication with people who can help articulate the experiences of people who are blind and visually impaired because they are going through them themselves. Right, so today we actually wanted to highlight uh, two individuals that we both spoke with uh, people we're familiar with, and people who also actually are familiar both with the uh, Chicago Lighthouse. It's uh, Robin Wallen uh, in Missouri and Andy Fabino uh, from uh, Illinois. And uh, we apologize not having them on here themselves for the Facebook Live. It was a technical issue that we're trying to figure out with the timing. Uh, so what we did on our own is we had conversations with them and did interviews, and uh, we're going to be reporting on them and uh, the issues that we all discussed. Uh, what they're basically doing to keep busy, what issues were important to them, and also uh, what the visually impaired and blind community is all concerned about. Yeah, so I spoke to Andy and um, I first asked him what book is he reading and he is reading The Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain, an old classic, um, and he's using his Google box to listen to this book. And I've known Andy for about five years now. I first met him when he participated in one of my research studies and we have become good friends since. He's someone that I talk to weekly and sometimes daily. We bounce ideas off of each other and he's been a really great source of uh, my personal education and encouragement. So I'm really thankful to him for that. Um, Andy lost his vision five, about eight years ago and this was as a result of a traumatic injury. He no longer has his light perception. He's married to an amazing woman, Christy, who has, um, 
and he, she and her, both her, their boys, six boys, they uh, both give Andy a lot of love and support, which is really important. And as right now, Chris, uh, Christy's going to post Andy's picture in the comments if anyone wants to catch Andy listening to his Google box, you can um, go ahead and take a look at that. Um, well, the topic that I discuss with Andy is help, and that includes how to ask for help, if you're accustomed to doing things independently, and then how to decline help if you feel like it's going to put you at risk. But prior to losing his vision, Andy describes himself as very prideful and very independent. And when he lost his vision, he found that his biggest challenge was just coming to terms with knowing that he would need help in the future, and he had to figure out how to ask for it. So over time, he did adjust to his vision loss, and his life is very full of activities. He has uh, a lot of friends, family members, he has a new granddaughter, um, he has really great independence, but then the coronavirus hit and he really feels like his independence was abruptly decreased. Um, for example, he used to be able to go to the store um, with his wife and he'd go through the aisles, pick up the items on his own. He knew where things were located and um, that gave him a great amount of independence. But now with uh, you know all of the sheltering in place, he feels like he, these things are no longer accessible to him. So a lot of things have gone online and a lot of these websites are not accessible for people who are blind and visually impaired. So he's finding that he has to have, ask for help with purchasing items that uh, were really easy for him to purchase before. And now he has to ask for help in navigating these websites. So um, that to him feels like a great loss of independence. Um, and he says it's really hard to ask for people outside his family for help. He doesn't know who's there to help him and who may be trying to take advantage of him. He has to take time to build up a trust relationship with people. But in the midst of this crisis, he just really doesn't have time to vet people in the same way that he used to. And that's because he has to ask for help with even just the essentials. So he's had to just trust his instincts about people and um, whether or not they're, what their intentions are. And people do actually want to help. We've seen a, a lot of communities really coming together to help in a lot of ways. But his other additional concern is whether that person that he that is helping him is sick and whether they're taking appropriate measures to protect themselves. So um, he says when he's he's taking a walk, for example, he can't see whether that person who walks, walks past him is wearing a mask or not. So he just has to trust that they are. And an example of this is he was coming out of his apartment complex and um, coming down the stairs and a woman offered to hold the door for him who was who, she was coming in while he was coming out. And uh, she said, sir, I have the door for you. And he just said he could sense that she wasn't wearing a mask. He was very nervous to go past her because to go through the door, he'd have to come like within a foot of her. And um, he wasn't sure if that was you know, appropriate or safe for him to do. So he had to politely decline her gesture. And he says that people who are in is his same experience should not feel um, you know, guilty or upset about having to tell people, no, thank you. Um, it could it could actually save your life and it could put you out of risk to do that. So don't hesitate to do that. To do that. Um, he also says his sister is a frontline nurse in Virginia and she wants to share with us her advice. And that is, I'll wear my mask to save your life. If you, will you wear your mask to save my life? And he feels like this is really great advice and a good question to ask everyone out in the public now. Are you wearing your mask? Are you protecting yourself? And are you protecting others? So uh, we thank Andy's sister for that. And we ask everyone to consider that. And this last little bit of information that he wants to share is that while people who um, may live in apartment complexes and condo buildings, they are avoiding touching walls and touching railings and the elevator. I know I'm always using my key to touch the elevator um, button. But he says that, again, for people who have visual impairments, um, they do what's tra called trailing, and that's using uh, their hands to touch the surfaces. And it really helps to navigate around. So he, his wife has been the sole person that's going around and disinfecting constantly, disinfecting the doors in the common areas. And he asked, if you live in these types of buildings, you know, chip in, put in a helping hand. It's really easy just to go out. You know, if everyone's doing it together and taking care of these common areas, it's really just a small task. So um, I'd like to thank Andy, as always, for sharing his experiences with not just me, but with everyone. Um, and the next person that we're going to talk about is someone that you've been talking to, and um, you can go ahead and share. Yeah, I first, want, I first wanted to comment uh, about Andy. Andy, it was great talking with you. I know you've been commenting here. So as Robin, I'll talk about it in a sec, our conversation. So thank you. And uh, I like that part about the common areas and doing your part. I also live in an apartment building and I'll, I'm, uh, you know what? We all learn from each other and I'm gonna keep mindful for that too. 
for everyone in my building. So thank you, I appreciate that. Um, and uh, also Andy, when this is all over, I know we met just on the phone. Hopefully we can go grab that beer one day and meet in person. I'd like that. really <laughs> That'd like be that. great. Um, so I, so Robin uh, is somebody I've been talking with for the past two years. Uh, she uses OrCam, but not only that, we've discussed other issues and other things. And we've talked about many, many topics and it's always wonderful talking to her. I'm always learning stuff from her. So uh, she's reading right now, and I just wrote it down. She's reading um, uh, for World Book Day, Crossing Over a Mexican Family on the Migrant Trail. So it was very interesting and the backstory behind it was, but I really wanna get to the stuff that we spoke of and also what she's doing lately. So Robin is visually impaired. Her husband, Mark is blind and they are both living in Missouri and they've been doing a lot of Zoom meetings. Uh, with organizations like ACB, NFB, and just staying involved with the uh, community. Uh, they've also been on Zoom meetings with friends and a neighbor um, and sitting on the patio. I uh, was talking with her the other day and I heard the wind chimes, which is nice because I'm stuck in an apartment. So it was just nice to hear that, I guess, uh, from somebody sitting outside. And then just going for walks in the neighborhood, which is great. Um, you know, we had mostly our discussions on um, transportation, which is what we really wanted to discuss uh, for someone who's blind or visually impaired, but not only that, for people with disabilities, the elderly, and really transportation for everyone. And it's really um, upsetting to a lot of people. And when me and Robin spoke, is that really initially when plans were made about transit, transportation, or things happening, uh, in, in, in our cities, in our towns, is that really people with disabilities were not given a first given thought uh, to when these plans were made, such as drive up testing sites. So, you know, how is, not everybody can get in a car and drive up to a drive up testing site. Now, I know they're realizing that in here, like in New York City, they're, uh, they're placing areas where people can walk to to get tested. But what if you're in a rural area and you wanted to get tested. I mean, it could be far away and you maybe don't wanna take a cab or a car or somebody came in your home cannot drive you and you can't get there. So that was an issue. Uh, mm -hmm. Something that uh, Robin spoke of that was, was, was a long conversation, which was great, is that she said, great, in my, in my neighborhood, a local hospital is offering COVID-19 testing. I can, if I'm feeling symptoms, I can schedule an appointment I can get to the hospital and get my test. But she says, then how am I gonna get home? So it, that's a huge issue because if you yeah. go there, you test positive, you're not, uh, let's say sick enough to be admitted to the hospital. Now you're gonna get in a cab and infect somebody else or who's gonna wanna take you or do you even have a ride to get home? I mean, do you take the chance and try to walk home? Uh, there was actually right after I got off the phone and you saw this too, Dr. Grant, uh, yeah. There was a newspaper article that came out, a story that came out about a gentleman who went to the hospital and is visually impaired. Uh, two hours later, they dismissed him. They basically told the family, don't worry, we'll take care of him. We'll call you as soon as everything happens. He was waiting in the waiting room for his family to come back and pick them up because of policies. They wouldn't let the family in the hospital. He sat there waiting, was told to leave. So he left. He didn't know where to go. And they found him wandering around outside. They lost him for a while. Uh, he was elderly, his English is not his first language, and he's visually impaired. Uh, the hospital has now, of course, you know, changed their policies uh, concerning this, but it is a concern for many individuals. Um, you know, and, and as Robin was saying, and she, she mentioned, you know, basically you can't leave your home unless it's a life or death situation. Um, but what I recommend, and definitely everyone needs to do, is if you're feeling any type of symptoms, sick, sickness, or you feel like maybe I do have COVID-19, you know, call your doctor, even if it's something minor, because you don't know if something is going to get worse. Uh, Robin commented to me that she had a problem with her lungs from something in the past. And, you know, what if something from that from way in the past is now coming up now as a small symptom, but it could be make something worse. So really stay in touch with your doctor. And what I wanted to read to everybody is I looked up what the CDC recommends. So the CDC on their page did have an area for people with disabilities. And what they say on there is they, they said, and I'm just gonna read from what I have here, is that um, they said, stay at home if you think you have COVID-19. 
most people have mild illness and will recover at home. So, I mean, that's a positive thing, but they also say get rest, hydrate, stay in touch with your doctor, as I already said, avoid public transportation. You really just wanna stay home anyway. And if you're with somebody else in the home, put yourself in one room and wear a mask if they enter. Uh, monitor your condition. And if you have any of the warning signs or the emergency warning signs, this is a reason to then possibly, um, you know, call your doctor, call an ambulance or go to the hospital, which is mm -hmm. trouble breathing, which you would go to the hospital, persistent pain or pressure in your chest and confusion and or bluish lips or face. Now, as Robin said, when we were talking about this, she goes, confusion, if I'm so confused, how am I gonna get to the hospital? I think this is when they're talking about fever, but that makes sense too. Um, and definitely, you know, consult a medical uh, provider. So, I mean, that's from the CDC. Unfortunately, right now, I think what it is, it's everything's a case by case. Uh, I even had a, a thought, like if somebody does go to a hospital, maybe they have to have a plan where ambulances yeah. can take people home. They're, right now, they don't, but maybe in now in this pandemic, maybe they have to make case by case decisions for ambulances to give rides or a hospital somehow to give rides to people to get home who can't necessarily drive. Um, we also discussed uh, stuff about paratransit and bus service. So like here in New York City, they cut subway service um, down. So now you have many, many more people in one subway car, which is not what we want. I've been mm -hmm. walking myself 40 blocks to get to the clinic where I work two days a week. Uh, but regular bus service is down in her area and paratransit uh, has had cuts also because they don't have enough drivers. They don't have, uh, a lot of drivers have been sick and there's long wait times. Uh, so they're saying only call for essential trips. What they're saying essential trips is doctor visits and stuff like that. But aren't groceries and shopping and things yeah. like that, you know, essential trips? So, uh, you know, yeah. Yeah, I know there's apps and things that you can order, but unfortunately you can order deliveries of things, but unfortunately there's no delivery times. Uh, and this is something we discussed also. There's many, mm -hmm. many people who can and are able-bodied who can drive and get to the market and get to the grocery stores. They can drive and go and they're taking up all the delivery times. So something maybe needs to be done about that. Um, and also something that really Robin brought my attention, which I didn't know, is that food stamps, uh, if you're on food stamps, you cannot use it for delivery. You have to be in person to use it and you can't just give your food stamps to someone else. It has to be you using it. So that's a whole nother issue and a whole other problem that maybe hopefully they're making changes. So as me and Robin were talking, you know, really unfortunately, because this is such unprecedented times, this is a city by city, county by county, state by state situation. Um, it's different everywhere, different in New York City, to different in Chicago, maybe a little similar because we're two big cities, but if you're in a rural area, uh, it can be so so different. Um, so I looked at what the NFB was saying for your, uh, they say, and which I think is important is to, you know, contact your state affiliate, which uh, could, you know, they know what's going on in your area and all the resources that are there. Uh, I like one of Robin's solutions. She calls it the drive up prisoner exchange program. <laughs> and basically what this is, is her, our son who lives about 10 miles away, comes and drops off a package, leaves it on the porch. He goes, runs back to the car, calls, yeah. calls his mom, says the package is delivered. She runs out, gets it and runs back in. So uh, th th that's her prisoner exchange program. Um, but we, what we need to do is talk like we're talking about all this, yeah. come up with solutions, make a plan for the future. And when putting a plan together, really government and policymakers need to put all people into the solution and not just some. Uh, even Absolutely. the media didn't mention resources really until recently. And when they mentioned it here in New York, it was a tiny little uh, headline on the bottom that I could barely read. And I, I actually wrote an email into the local news and said, listen, you need to be mentioning this every half hour, hour out loud so people can hear where to find these resources. Yeah, resources are really important to know about. And thank you, Robin, for all of that information that you shared. I think it's important that we're spreading this awareness and um, letting people know either if you're in, in facing these uh, situations yourself, you know what to do. And if you're a person who is sighted, you may want to take a lot of this into consideration and you know, make sure that you're lending a helping hand to people and everyone should make a plan for themselves in case they get sick, you know, testing and 
um, hospital beds are scarce everywhere. So it's a really good idea to kind of make a plan in the event that you get sick. Um, so these resources, again, are really important. And uh, I know here in Illinois, if you go on the Illinois Department of Public Health website, they have a section for people who have disabilities and um, different things that you can do. And also the Chicago Lighthouse has been doing really great and they're pulling um, all of these resources together and they're listing them on our page. So um, that is something that's really important. You might wanna check that out. We, again, will post our link on our Facebook, on the Chicago Lighthouse Facebook page so that you're able to uh, go to that site and see what type of recommendations are being made. Um, and actually, Dr. Actually, Cara Cronus, uh, from the Chicago Lighthouse provided some information to us that uh, statistics, there's a statistics website that's accessible for people who are blind or visually impaired. And we're going to post that as well. So you can find out like a statistics tracker uh, and it is accessible, which is important. Uh, also, uh, let's see, Rebecca Blackburn from Arlington Heights, Illinois, uh, asked another question. Um, if you live in a building with a homeowners association, reach out to your board, board for assistance. Our homeowners association has set up services for people in need so they can provide masks, games, errands, recipes. So that's really actually a good tip as well. That is a very good tip. And um, Julia Hall from Chandler, Arizona, she says to check with your insurance carrier about online health and medical services that are covered. Um, she is currently using a teledoctor for her minor medical services. So that's a really great tip is um, just to go to your insurance company and see what's covered and make sure you're not getting a huge bill for some of these uh, services that are provided. Oh, definitely. That's a good idea. Uh, you, you, I mean, you, you, a lot of uh, doctors who never did telemedicine before, I know in optometry and ophthalmology, we're figuring that out now, how to do telemedicine, and it's actually happening, and it's keeping people out of the emergency room, and that's really what needs to be done, is keeping everyone out of the emergency room for those who are just sick with urgent care or emergency. So we thank everyone for joining us again this week um, and discussing some of these really important issues and uh, resources. We ask that you join us again next week, same time, same place. Uh, we're going to have, uh, if all goes well with our technology, we're going to bring in uh, Dr. Michael Smith, who is a clinical psychologist at the Chicago Lighthouse. He's going to join us. So if you have questions for him, please, you know, once we post that, go ahead and start asking him right away and then we can make sure that we address them. Yes, we'd love more of your questions, more of your feedback, even resources, because we're going to combine all those resources and put it online on the Chicago Lighthouse web webpage. And I really, really want to thank Robin and Andy. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Uh, I always learn from everyone. Uh, so I loved talking to you both. And I know we're all going to be in touch still and all to the rest of you as well. Stay well, stay safe, wash your hands, and don't touch your face. Thank you so much. Thank you.